Hello everyone, today we talk about 16th century Polish army organization. A year ago I had made a video on the 17th century, it's gonna be fundamentally about the, the late 15th and the 16th. Uh, we will add something new of course, um, and yet certain aspects naturally are in common also with the following century. Um, and we will talk in, in very broad, very broad terms like this is Obviously, no, I'm not an expert personally, yet, nor I have this enormous amount of information. But as you know, uh, Polish Lithuanian telling the truth warfare is dramatically fascinating. Um, uh, throughout this period, Poland was essentially the, the chief power. In, in Eastern Europe, it possessed not only this vast territories stretching from the Baltic to, to the Black Sea and from Pomerania in the west, uh, eastwards, al almost to the Don River. Uh, but also, they had also remarkably effective armed forces for the time. Um, and, um, and they were kind of unique in their organization, tactics, and appearance in many ways, and combining, uh, let's say, certain aspects of uh, uh, east and west uh, traditions, we, we can say, uh, with a specific Polish and distinctive Polish character based on this fundamentally aristocratic ethos um, of gallantry and dash, and they uh, they managed to through this combination we will observe better today to take on many enemies like the Muscovites, the Cossacks, the Tartars, the Turks, the Austrians, the Germans, the Danes, Swedes, the Wallachians, etc. And as you know. Polish warfare had a great impact actually in, in the 17th century though in the development of the Swedish military reforms by Gustavus Adolphus that learned a lot while campaigning against uh, the Poles, right? Even um, th th this is f fairly unknown, you know, especially that the revival of cavalry in Western warfare from the, the second half of the 17th century onwards, but even if you know the, the tides had already turned towards roughly the, the beginning of the century, however, it owed much at the uh, indirectly at the Polish hussars and their their effectiveness uh, in open field um, and their mobility that, in order to be coped with by the Swedes, that because Gustavus Adolphus kind of re, uh, in fact, revived cavalry, cavalry tactics, and that's where essentially, eventually, also linear tactics, um, as, as a consequence, uh, transformed. Like because Pike uh, kind of fell imported, that was mostly because of firearms, but the there was still some, if not a preconception towards cavalry, but as you know. Uh, Renaissance warfare had fundamentally, mm, ref, you know, repressed in some ways the, the power of cavalry on the battlefield, thanks to the pike and shot combination. Following the pike because of firearms, cavalry had to return, and the, the new patterns that the Swedes invented were also in part influenced by what they had learned in the East. And this is very important because uh, of the geographical dimension of Poland, L Lithuanian, because. Um, it, these are enormous lands, right, in the east, stretching basically up to the steppes, right, so literally uh, the Poles had to fight uh, in areas that where cavalry was of pivotal importance since uh, ever, like in the, in the millennia, and still coping with uh, Western warfare, which they were part of technically, uh, as well. And in fact, an aspect of, of Polish warfare of this period is that there was a sort of um, I don't know even how to call it, but a, a re-easternization -easter in, in some fashion, because um, Polish armies, for example, of the late 15th century, were actually more similar to the Western ones um, they were than the ones that they would start developing, especially from the second half of the, f of the 16th, right? You know, and this partly was due to the also to uh, the strategic needs of the Poles that had to first of all cover large distances all across this enormous uh, commonwealth but also fighting with the most diverse enemies in a situation where early modern period 
warfare, warfare was dramatically intensifying on a large scale, and it required, and this was also the main problem of Poland that eventually in the second half of the 17th century would, would decline in spite of the very strong base that it had had in the early modern period. The Polish monarchy had, of course at this point Polish-Lithuanian is a sum of, um, of dynastic possessions, but uh, Poland specifically had, had kind of consistent problems in terms of political centralization. Like, um, medieval Poland had had certain moments of, let's say, progressive reunification, but it, it they had lasted for a few, and the nobility, as a consequence, had gained enormous privileges, and as a consequence, there was a privatization also of military culture, as it will be even in here. And the the whole deal in in Renaissance times instead was the exact you know countering this push this was a condition that can be observed also in other areas of Europe but um, you know with much less effect than, than in the East meaning that especially these elective uh, monarchies like I don't know even the one of Hungary had been or Bohemia um, had had essentially this similar problems uh, even though they're kind of characteristically different but you know in the in the West, I don't know, the French kingdom, the English kingdom, um, they, they had, for example, a much sounder tradition of monarchic unity, right, that, that in Poland it lacked, right? So um, most of this period, especially during the 16th century, Poland actually was a, a great might. This is at, at the peak, if you want, of its, um, of its power. Um, but at the same time, struggling F- like uh, more than mon- increasingly more than others for imposing kind of a more centralized asset, essentially for the need of of having an army, because the the real problem around which all of this uh, revolt was objectively and renowningly having enough money, right, enough tax uh, t- uh, to 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 levy an army, to pay an army. Right. Th- this is a problem, of, strictly speaking, of money, and it's obvious that if the country is ruled by um, powerful families, will essentially have uh, a, st- a state within uh, their own territory, you know, that where not even the crown can enter. You know, that that is a problem because th- they are not going to to pay. They're not going to participate while actually carrying out their own. Um, um, you know, private policies and have, uh, having actually their own armies, right? All these great magnates of Poland uh, that were increasingly co-opted by the the, the crown and, and the parliament, actually, because uh, the same was mm, uh, trying to, especially to to reinforce a certain specific family assets to at least tie them to the crown, like giving privileges that, of course, only the crown recognized. Uh, in a measure that, okay, yes, these families became more powerful, but at least they, they were individually easier to control than uh, other kind of tons of scattered uh, elements that were also kind of more difficult to organize. And in fact, essentially, uh, I- in at this point, as we will see, uh, there, there would be an attempt for uh, the crown to levy its own proper, properly royal army, right? So having essentially a core of troops we have talked about this is also in the video on the 17th century they were financed by by their own uh, assets the royal assets but then a general levy uh the quarter levy that however kind of declined over time or at least at one point it had kind of became would become obsolete and also certain commissions of course um like with the famous rota system also of uh, hiring uh, that were given to the same um, Polish nobles that at that point basically received money in order to or commissions to levy a certain amount of troops and uh, so technically you you would have vassals as a king that owe you a service but you know that you would be obliged to pay them and this as we know had always existed like since uh, feudalism had uh, had existed in part but it had increased and this these were problems that. I don't know. In Western Europe, were being faced uh, during during the 14th century. Um, here we are, kind of later, and yet the uh, the, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth is enormous, right? This is not a small uh, 
Karana. Actually, it's a sum of possessions. It's not even properly just the kingdom of Poland, which is just a chunk of, of the wall, right? So, it's very complicated. Um, but the interesting thing about it is also this kind of um, foreign influence in Polish warfare that has remained always there as a mm, structural element uh, of the... Uh, exactly because of this... Also, these political problems, like the, the the kings that were often foreigners them, th themselves, needed troops that could be kind of more loyal to them than than the local nobility that was always kind of looking, like and there was also xenophobia raising because of this, you know, from the nobility that was traditionally ah we are, we are Polish we have to counter this foreign kings that we made a favor to to come here to rule us. Naturally, the kings were looking for you know to achieve something kind of more centralized for the sake of a better organization, of course, an increase of power over the, the, the nobility, but um, in trying to, to use kind of foreign elements that in fact enriched Polish-Lithuanian warfare this time, and, and also made it more flexible, right? And, and this passed not just through the kings, but through the fact that also certain types of troops in, Sp in Poland were kind of more difficult to find. Right, not much for the typology in itself, but rather for the uh, social classes that could be uh, could could produce them. Um, Poland didn't have the, the same levels of development of I don't know cities, for example, uh, that, that in Western Europe uh, that they, they were on average there was a lower per capita wealth. Uh, it was difficult to, in this sense, frame lots of troops to to, to train them properly to equip. In fact, there, there was a, this mostly passed, there was mostly a lack of, of interest in, in, a relative lack of interest in infantry that was usually provided by German mercenaries, for example, but also for heavy cavalry that, of course, we know that the Polish Hussars were kind of, uh, at this point, they're actually developing, right? Initially, the Poles had kind of an ultra-heavy uh, an elite cavalry, like just the rest of Western Europeans. The Hussars evolved from seemingly from the, the model of the Serbian mercenaries, that initially was actually light cavalry, and in Poland eventually comes the kind of the shock elite cavalry per excellence. Um, and, um, and, um, but, but in general, you know, the, 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 there was a heavy reliance in Polish uh, warfare, especially the, the monarchic one, the royal one, on foreign mercenaries that were always there. And Poland was was definitely not isolated. It was definitely into the midst of the major Central European, um, you know, political military affairs. And it it was exposed continuously to to warfare and uh, as a consequence to hybridization with the surrounding military cultures, and uh, and so on. So, in, in the late 15th century, the Polish army was raised uh, mainly through the nobility. Right, this was the the base of which the, a, a normal feudal kingdom would kind of form. Like you know, the the uh, the, the the cities in 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 this kind of more central eastern European monarchies were kind. Of, and I made a video about these. Uh, made a video about the kingdoms of Poland, Bohemia, and Hungary during the, the low Middle Ages. Mm, had seen a relatively contained urban development. Uh, hence, also a greater difficulty for for kings to rely on a sound base of, for example, of troops coming mostly from from that environment, and even having certain technological assets. For example, as we will see, most of Polish artillery was manned by foreigners, mostly Italians. Um, the uh, the infantry we have recalled it was the, the the one the professional one of pikemen, which mostly came from Germany, because essentially the middle classes had been kind of uh, choked by the nobility and instead had gained this enormous uh, space. Um, and this, the, the Polish armies being recruited to the nobility w was something that happened only when ar urgently required, right? Uh, for example, in the event of a major invasion, um, during which, of course, other elements of society would participate. There would surely be large numbers of additional gentry in town and peasant militias, to be called called out, but naturally these were becoming kind of an anach anachronistic system uh, that, uh, especially throughout the modern age, would obviously uh, emerge, right? Uh, 
uh, the, the crack cavalry were western style knights in full plate armor on armored horses, right? The typical kind of uh, major, especially Gothic model, you know, um, with these. Um, and, and they were equipped with the uh, heavy medieval lanks supported by lighter lancers. Um, equipped in mail and or half armor in mounted crossbow and sword and shield men uh, known as half armor um, so the typical units of you know of sol soldiery of the late uh, middle ages which revolve around the center of the ultra heavily armored uh, knight and then other lighter troops uh, as a as a retinue um, Lithuania was somewhat uh, a bit different from Poland. Like definitely, Poland was the most advanced um, uh, part of the of the Commonwealth. Uh, Lithuania was somewhat similar, more similar to to Eastern Europe in proper. Like uh, the, there were many analogies with Russia as well, and you know that it was technically Lithuania that had come to encompass most areas of what are kind of the steppes. Uh, uh, in the south, right, and historically, um, and the uh, this the Lithuania normally supplied mailed cavalry with spear and shield and Tartars as well with bows because Tartars, as we will see later, were also a very important component of the Polish Lithuanian armies and, and and not just as a um, as a as units but also as a political presence in the southeast of the Commonwealth that shielded them again from from other or shielded the, the Commonwealth from other Tartars, and that had their own particular military style and their semi nomadic uh, war type of warfare right. Um, when it comes to infantry, we see that at, at the end of the 15th century, essentially. They were very similar to, to to other Western types. I mean, there, there wasn't any substantial difference. Yet th there is the very interesting presence of um, full plate armor, infantry, as well, associated with pavises, um, and and also a, a large amount of of um, missile troops. Um, this is a development that I suspect we we have traced in part in the previous. In some videos we already made on Polish warfare during the Middle Ages, the need for a solid front, um, armored and shielded like can, from, from missile fire that from the east always arrived towards those areas, and lots of, of missile troops to counter that same uh, arrow hail that, that could uh, would shower the ranks, etc. But this was also... An, a, Progressively, cro the crossbow was substituted with uh, with handguns. At this time, I actually think handguns being already prevalent into Polish infantry, uh, and uh, ev eventually being substituted with other like arquebuses, etc. But later on, though, um, and but but infantry really not representing uh, a terrific uh, element of, of Polish warfare at this time. And the trend, as we were saying before, would be mostly would be mostly shifting towards cavalry um in the in the mid in the mid sixteenth century. And as we were saying before, in the sixteenth century a small standing army was created. It's weapons and equipment provided by the state. This being very important because through that you can essentially measure what the uh, the power of the crown was right. How much assets it owned, how, and, and and as you know, the, the largest expenses of every political or every polity at the time were about the army. So that was a political as well as military na uh, measure to 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 value in this context. Um, and as we were saying before as well, there were lots of mercenaries coming from Germany. Scotland, Hungary, uh, Bohemia, the Netherlands, hmm? and there were naturally also Polish mercenaries, right? They were also kind of uh, patriotic in their in, in mindset um, that could be hired when needed, uh, and also in, in, in case of a, a lar large-scale conflict, um, the masses of gentry and peasant militia could be raised on the old yet always more outdated lines. Mm -hmm. 
the Polish king Stephen Bathory, uh, 1576-1586, continued this reorganization, introducing new infantry formations of peasants from royal estates, right? Um, infantry r actually was um, still not really increasing um, overall in, in, the, in Polish warfare, but still it was needed, of course, and the uh, it's obvious that being levied from, um, you know, lower strata of the population, it, it could be thought that they were somewhat closer to to the crown interests, right? This happened also in many other European countries in the sense that, you know, the, the kings sometimes were much more democratic, for example, than, than the nobility was, right? This is very interesting. Of course, democratic, I'm, I'm using a big word here, but in the sense that... Uh, we we made several videos also about this in medieval society playlist would ally with the peasantry sometimes to counter uh, the nobility uh, in uh, in certain regions etc. So this could be uh, an effective way of dealing uh, with politically and militarily, but still it wouldn't quite work on the long run, right? And uh, Stephen Bathory being ruler of Transylvania, actually, and becoming Polish king, but was responsible for introducing the Hungarian, and also probably Balakian troops that would have a mm, substantial impact in certain, as we will see later, uh, on Polish warfare, certain types of units, uh, etc. Um, so this 16th century reorganization included, naturally, an effective military administration and the permanent division of the army into the so-called rotas, right? The rota uh, corresponding essentially to a company um, being officially of, uh, well, it kind of depends, but it was normally like one-third of cavalry and two-thirds of, of, of infantry. Um, they uh, they would have the, the rotas, however, could be levied in, in several ways. Like the, uh, the rota, if I remember correctly, was actually already the name of the of the private companies proper in there, meaning that the, the, the king had his own rotas, but the nobles had their own rotas that they actually fed and you know levied on their own, right, to do whatever they wanted at that point. So that's also why you 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 understand why why. The nobility, at, at least cert the most powerful ones, w would be co-opted because they, they by the, the crown because they for for the organization of the army and giving it the most prestigious post because they had the best military organization, private military organization on their own, and would, there would be an increase in the rotas uh, from in terms of proportion and cavalry infantry towards uh, strongly towards the, the importance of the first right. Eventually, there were. Uh, cavalry rotas known as the standards that had up to 200 men mm -hmm. um, and during the 16th century um, I, I don't want to banalize or approximate too much but basically it was no larger permanent organization in the Polish army right so it was uh, still um, kind of it was a functional system and you don't have to think it was inefficient by side you know th given the context it, it did work but still uh, it kind of lagged behind compared to other powers that eventually would also, especially in the following centuries, implement on it. Uh, it did this enhance this, the, their own more centralized systems and also creating uh, Poland quite quite of a problem. Um, in terms of tactical, like, for example, infantry rotas could be grouped into a regiment, right? But this was not a tactical unit. The rotas still acted independently on the field as companies. That w that's what companies normally do, right? The company is the uh, normally the largest unit on the field. That I mean, the, this commanded from the field. It means it means means its officers being a, ca a captain or something is the guy who, who is within the uh, within the unit himself and directs it from the field. The others kind of don't. Um, they rule from from the distance, from the above, uh, in a certain sense, and so the regiments were created essentially as an administrative repetition. While on the field, these routes would behave very dynamically, right? Especially the uh, 
the cavalry ones. Um, for example, these were organized into so-called hoofs, uh, up sometimes of um, several um, thousand strong, right? So, um, and the, the hoof was properly a tactical unit, but the same uh, rotus that constituted it, um, or even multiple rotus put together, could be uh, readily and rapidly detached on the field to deal with emergencies and therefore depart from the unit from the, this kind of greater hoof. And uh, and this is kind of normal because, you know, thousands of cavalry can think of a unit that is not subdivided for, for the, those tactical roles. But uh, the formation of the hoof also shows you uh, how important the uh, the shock effect of Polish cavalry had come to. Like, because having effectively a unit done on the field, you could launch towards the enemy, like with thousands of cavalry. I mean, it, it's, it's very important, and it's uh, meant, obviously, to be kind of a shock effect. Because otherwise, you know, if, if it required kind of more complex maneuvers, uh, which they could carry out, but they wouldn't in this case, um, uh, that would mean that that it would be either a combined tax, uh, tactics like horse archery or something. This was like he uh, shock cavalry. It was evolving uh, like that. And each rota was commanded by uh, uh, Rotmistrz. Um, I don't know how to say it in Polish, but it would be the Rotmeister, right? So the 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 captain of the of the cavalry formation, um, and we had a standard, right? And in, in case instead the, the infantry once had a, had a drummer, with a small drum at the waist, beaten with a single mallet and bagpiper as well, uh, so needing this discipline in uh, infantry coordination through mu musical instruments. And the cavalry instead being kind of more more immediate in, in need and kind of more visual in, in terms of communication and time. Um, and and you can see during the 16th century uh, the the massive increase of cavalry. Basically, of these formations, kind of 75 percent was cavalry, meaning the Polish army. And um, at this point, much was changing also in terms of tactical. Uh, like uh, in terms of unit types, for example, the fully plate armored lancers survived in Poland up to the up to very late in like the the eighties of the uh, of the sixteenth century, right? And uh, th this is interesting because in in Europe it had happened kind of uh, earlier, right? Um, I mean, obviously up to all the uh, first half of the 17th century, Western warfare was characterized also by certain cuirassiers uh, that were all covered from from head to toe in, in iron, right? But um, in Poland, you see, for example, that even you know horse armor ar arrives quite uh, easily up to the mid 16th century without the same um, you know dramatic fall that had happened proportionally uh, in, in the West. I mean, it's not a massive difference, but it's still meaningful of a kind of a, um, archaism and uh, anachronism of success, though, right? This is very important but with the same hussars, right? They, If you think about it, they were anachronistic. Th this uh, heavily armored knights still being there in the Polish army in the at the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, but they had been, they had worked. Right, and they had worked uh, occasionally in very well also against the, the most updated Western tactics at, at some point. So, uh, this naturally tells you how technology is not really everything. It depends on how you use these troops and how they are they are motivated with what the the context, the, the terrain, the, the environment is, um, and definitely for these enormous spaces of the East cavalry was needed in part also in kind of older models right and but the, probably in fact the, the most important unit type that emerges from from this period are the famous hussars right that were to be the elite of Poland's cavalry uh, as we have seen up to the beginning of the 18th century 
And the, the concept of USAR, now we have never explained in Schwerpunkt, now we don't have time, but let's say it evolved actually from a lighter form, uh, or at least a lighter form that had developed in turn into the, um, in the early, uh, let's say during the, the 15th century, the, at least the Poles had started to hire the Serbian Hussars, right? They started uh, kind of emulating uh, a bit. They, they were unarmored cavalry, kind of light one. Very similar turn of truth to certain um, even Ottoman units that that were present in um, in uh, you know you could see in, in Balkan war Balkanic warfare pretty pretty easy. There's a there's a lot of Balkanic influences in, in Polish warfare as well, and these units were equipped with uh, lance saber, uh, even the squarish Turkish shield that telling the truth also has its own counterpart in in the broader Slavic area and especially in the Balkans b from before therefore I don't think it's a straight Turkish uh, derivation and um, the Polish Lithuanian army would develop this unit into something different and heavier especially uh, but in mid 16th century the Polish Usars already wore mail and helmet becoming effectively more of a shock unit than what the original Hussar model was conceptually. And by the 80s of the 16th century, the Hussars had adopted a cuirass over the male as well. And that's how they replaced the full plate armored knight of Western model. Now, this is very interesting because you, you don't see this happening in any other European country. It had stuck to an essentially Western tradition, they had increased, for example, their uh, number of skirmishers in the sense of take the right uh, and what they represented. But they were still essentially um, on a hybrid of different Western models, if you want. The Poles instead uh, trade, uh, if you want, the, the full plate armor knight, armored knight uh, of the late medieval tradition with this kind of uh, lighter cavalry men, which is kind of odd of, sp of speaking of the Polish Usars in those terms because they were actually heavy cavalry for sure, but they, they belonged to a different philosophy. They were a transplant of a Balkanic tradition, at least, that they m modeled in a, in a certain way that fundamentally combined mobility uh, that was typical with, of the kind of the more the Eastern tradition with and um, and kind of also mobility and dynamism and uh, flexibility. Also, if you look at their equipment and, and also the mindset of the Polish Usar is, is pretty damn open to every kind of weaponry, right? But still, and with the same Western uh, heaviness and and shock character, right? And this this is very important because. In fact, the, the equipment also of the Polish Usar is is very peculiar. You you don't find a unit like that uh, elsewhere the, the, because the, the the military backgrounds from which these cultures came were were somewhat developing other systems. So the Poland had uh, that were they were also, however, kind of older and more defined. Poland had the capacity of making kind of an original synthesis out of it. And a pretty damn effective one that could cope, because this is really the problem with all the the, the, the most diverse enemies that the Poles had in uh, at their frontiers. So um, it, it, you you have to give an enormous credit to that, and you know the Polish Hussar being still kind of probably the most famous cavalry uh, unit in in in, in history, right? Um, so the, um, the there were, there would be a lot to say, including the fact that, that the Usars made use of an early use of firearms, right? A very precocious use of one, and this is interesting as well because they were combining uh, in, in into their their model also partly what the Western writer was conceptually speaking, but it was more than that. It was like a complete. Um, professionalism, like the idea that you can use basically every single type of weapon and uh, intervening preferably as shock cavalry but also coping with situations that could 
could vary pretty quickly on, on the same field as well. Um, and the there would be, you know, the, the normal equipment would um, include the famous concierge, I believe it's called, uh, that is a straight sword. Mm -hmm. That also um, the uh, would be coupled with a saber, and the difference in uh, incidentally is that the the concerts I is more uh, essentially like a, a a shock weapon, like it's made in f effectively for thrusting during during cavalry charge, and of course they they would have their own lances that were also uh, produced by the. Um, the state, uh, because they were uh, pretty expansive, and um, th these long lances with pennants are kind of also very, very typical, and um, they they were also quite technically uh, advanced. I mean, and the concerts would be kind of more against for against armored opponents, of course, sticking it into the uh, gobs of plate armor or and or using it as a real you know even for charging properly and uh, the saber instead being for buttering down lightly or uh, or even unarmored opponents and being typical of also of the of steps warfare right and and pouring dough in, in the west through these uh, kind of volcanic and uh, eastern european contexts as well in, in the future right especially during the 18th century it would be a great um inclusion of this lighter cavalries from from these geographical heirs because they had a long tradition with that kind of equipment that in Poland and this is the interesting thing that while in the Balkans I mean as we've seen with the Serbian Usar you you could have the, you had this type of warfare since ever because all the Balkans in over and another had been influenced by step warfare and kind of kind of more eastern models so in Poland it was quite a bit different. Like in Russia there had been these things, especially after the Mongol conquest, but Poland uh, during throughout all the Middle Ages up to now basically uh, had had essentially Western types of, of cavalry. Even if they probably had l lighter, ma uh, higher amounts of lighter mounted troops, but never quite this kind of so solidly uh, Eastern influence wasn't so so evident like there was sarmatism as well in, in this context think of the there was pushed by the same nobility as a form of status of identity you know there was the emulation of the ancient sarmatian armor uh with the um scale uh, pattern you know uh, um plates etc and the um and this idea that in fact the this Type of warfare embodied by the the Usar was was kind of a was the pride of Poland and uh, an embodiment of aristocratic military culture, and that's why it became so representative as well because it wasn't just like a, a rationalized um, you know direction from the above that s started keeping troops in a kind of uh, it, it emerged in part from the same from the the, the needs of the, the larger amounts of Polish troops out there that were essentially framed under the nobility um command and that in this case represented the the ultra elite of the same nobles right so there are great meanings behind this and it, it, it's obviously interesting that the, the same crown would however had its own and part of them being same Polish nobility in fact so it's all intertwined, and uh, there were also tra blunt weapons like the the Najak, I believe it's pronounced the Najak Warhammer, um, that is has kind of the double. There is the kind of the flat square part made for piercing, like for smashing armor. Telling the truth, um, as you know, the, the quadrangular section is kind of more effective for mm, kind of demolishing the uh, the certain the metal. Surface and the uh, and then the pointy one uh, at, at the other end, very very effective weapon. That the the, the latter side being mostly for piercing other on other surfaces, etc. And and some of them actually use even a shield, which is usually not represented a great much, but actually it was pretty widespread 
uh, especially at the beginning of you know the, the most iconic Polish hussar is the, the one of the 17th century you see in every uh, art artistic depiction chiefly of you know the battle of Vienna etc but the the one of the 16th century was slightly different right not even all of them had all the the typical double wing the pair of wings for example the the, uh, the most extraordinary feature of the hussars was indeed this wing worn by some units and some of them was a, a single wind right made from a wing sorry from from a curved baton carrying eagle vulture feathers right and that could be attached to the rear of the saddle or by cross belts to the shoulders and making this guy spectacular as you know the, the the eagle is the white eagles especially is the symbol of Poland and uh, but having a much deeper meaning that is that the usual Indo-European uh, chivalric tradition of uh, of the steps you know the idea of the the, man, the freeman that is essentially a mounted fighter a mounted fighter and also in, in a solidly Christian background like this uh, even a symbol of angels this kind of demonic paradoxically because you know there's not much of a difference between angels and demons after all um, in the same Bible um, they um, it, it, the concept there is that these are coming from 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 the heavens to, to smash everybody was was in, in their way and this is the concept and and eventually um, uh, others there, there would be also mm, who starts with pairs of wings mm -hmm. especially seen in the, in the 17th century as, as we've seen and naturally we can't imagine a lot of variation what, what is said and I didn't say at the beginning is that we, we don't have a, a dramatic documentation about Polish warfare this time like on like in terms of sources I, I don't know how Polish historiography is dealing with this how much they are researching in this topics but you know Poland falls into a certain area that was still I don't know. Um, as we were saying before, th there wasn't much of a middle class. It was much of a um, great, um, you know, literary tradition, um, like in the Renaissance. And the, mo most of the the stuff that we know at this early date, especially in the 16th century, are from foreign observers, mostly Italians, French. Um, that, that that is pretty it's pretty similar to what. Uh, the, the attitude was towards the Ottomans, for example. That what we know is because someone traveled there from the West and started talking uh, and this and described to him. But actually, uh, there was there were also a lot of distortions. Uh, we'll talk about it later. To what was stereotypically Polish, for example, which seemingly Western Europe wasn't particularly well understood. Um, yet um, we we understand definitely that this type of warfare uh, developed locally in Poland had it was def definitely unique in, in its own way and the the wings themselves had seemingly this um, terrible audio effect let's say um, that d because during the charge uh, during the uh, at speed they, they would um, produce a torna uh, tornado like noise in the charge, um, a bit like the Stuka's scream, right, with devastating psychological effects. And uh, this is, uh, we have stressed on Schwerpunkt a lot, the, the psychological effect of cavalry. Like, people think that, you know, cavalry is mostly about the, sh the actual physical shock. This is radically wrong. I mean, cavalry has a, is pro a cavalry charge is literally in the whole history of mankind of warfare even in terms of compared to contemporary standards is one of the most shocking slash devastating slash traumatizing experiences can a person can ever suffer like don't think that shelling is something that far from the the, the trauma that you get when you're charged by cavalry uh, it, it, it it's something devastating and here you, you use even this um, uh, audio effects let's say that are even more terrifying and just imagine those uh, r regimental hoofs that we have described before with thousands of cavalry uh, 
it kept it like that and think of the sound it would make i mean it's it's mind blowing and, and this explains a lot also of you know polish military success in in conditions of n- very often of numerical inferiority that is documented by that that is naturally explained also because this was kind of elite cavalry so there were a few against larger numbers of lighter troops and uh, that's kind of easy but this is not to say that Polish cavalry was necessarily the, the best thing around it was it corresponded to the to the sound um, heavy cavalry uh, elite effect that you know was spread around every every nation kind of had something like this but but what I would like to make you understand is in how in Polish warfare cavalry proper aside from just the hussars here specifically had taken over num- numerically in this period and how this influenced the, the world Polish warfare as a much more uh, dynamic and um, you know coordinated thing that 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 is pretty impressive for for European standards and apparently these wings were also effective against the Tartar and Cossack lazos right that uh, made it kind of more difficult to to grip the, to, to catch uh, a Polish cavalryman like, like that to bring it down. Um, consider that cavalry warfare, aside from the obviously co- collective uh, training that determines mo- most of its effectiveness, it, it's also very manesque, let's say. It's very, uh, you know, cavalry men can literally, you know, fight at close quarters, uh, stab each other, wrestle, and etc. It's, it's, it's very physical, it's very close um, uh, uh, combat. And um, mounted crossbowmen changed to the arquebus early in the 16th century as well. And the same hussars would be supported by a few mounted arquebusiers similarly equipped. Right? So, this is interesting because we're not talking about wheel lock pistols, for example, as you find in uh, in Germany, as you're kind of more more famously in the mid 16th century, but literally arquebuses, right? And and this is uh, the this things exist also in the West naturally, but um, here it's as if uh, the, they were more spread in, among infantry there. In, in Poland, instead, it it's as if the, the number of arquebuses was being brought by the cavalry, right? And and it's and actually the same Usars as we were saying before made a very early use of this arquebuses, right? The, there was a great, uh, there was still the same uh, Lang's concept of the heavily armored knight and then the other lighter uh, troops in the retinue. In this case, passing from crossbows to arquebuses, but also the same Usar would would know perfectly how to use firearms and being very open to it, which is something that especially um, in the in the Eastern tradition wasn't quite evident. Like and especially among Tartars, firearms were seen with uh, with prejudice. Like the they they Tartars didn't want to abandon bows and they 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 had their own. Uh, firearms uh, and and troopers but they would be mocked because of the fact that they were all covered in the, in powder and all this stuff that would look black and so on um, in in this context I think uh, the the polish openness to today's technologies would be very useful on the eastern frontier in, uh, in that sense after all the the Tartars being Incapable at one point, even of coping with pike and shot tactics, for example, in the case when the Russians, exactly in this century, are starting to expand towards the east. Um, so, mm, this this modernization uh, of 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 the Usar that uh, is very important because it it kind of counters the stereotype that they were just an anachronistic unit. Actually, it was very 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 flexible, and to just say okay. The, they, these guys had remained to medieval cavalry it is not correct. It was just a, a very good adaptation to early modern warfare, and it lasted as, as long as it was functional on the battlefield. And that's how you have to see it. It was not a you know 
uh, curiosity or something. It, it had a, 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 me a deep meaning, especially in, in this context. Um, there would be other types of cavalry. Uh, the lesser gentry pro provided medium cavalry called panzerni, that is ironclads, um, and the um, uh, this weapons the, this units could inc use as well the the con concierge uh, type of sword uh, or for the Lithuanians uh, also short lances kind of resembling resenting more of uh, Eastern influence. Um, and some would replace bow and or pistols with an archipus as well. Uh, another proof in my opinion that uh, of, of the increased importance of cavalry proper so that infantry what, what was the you know the, the infantry was kind of of, of less importance and at that point you, you would need however to compensate firepower by making it adopted by by cavalry. Obviously it's not the same effect you know, a line, uh, you know, well-trained line of infantrymen using an arquebus is more effective than a well-lined, uh, you know, th than cavalry doing the same. But uh, still, you you're compensating, in fact, for for something else in this case, like the fact that you have a, f a few strong uh, infantry. You have you you need also strategically to move kind of faster to deploy more armies. Needing cavalry always more always increasingly to to defend the borders and and uh, so that is the good the best answer quite likely and the shield um they would may be made of twigs bound together and covered with silk or leather so that basically light shields that uh, at this point make you understand also that they were mostly designed for close combat on average than act actual defense uh, for from bullets of, from firearms evidently not but even from from arrows like it could work of course and, and and that's where we come to the light cavalry proper because as we will see also better later um, the Tartar slash Cossack uh, cavalry was of dramatic importance in Polish warfare the Cossacks living west of the the Dnieper River were under Polish suzerainty and known, in fact, as the loyal Cossacks, right? There were similar distinctions, like our Zvoje Pagania, for example, in Russia, uh, because these peoples had somewhat... They were not new uh, at the time. They, they, there had been some migrations in the 16th century had kind of reinforced them in certain areas, but, you know, the, the Poles, uh, the Lithuanians, had settled historically since the Middle Ages, many of these Tartars in, in their lands, um, and, and they they were acquainted to, to this. I mean, aside from the fact, I mean, even Poland was con was invaded by the Mongols, right? Was wiped by but the the so these peoples were all acquainted to these Eastern tactics, and they they would have uh, easy access to this large amount of light horsemen. They were the best of doing what, what they did in large masses and for skirmishing and pursuing and, and all this stuff. And the the typical, like, the, this, actually, this political uh, groups were fairly unstable, so they weren't maybe so loyal as it sounded, but they still sided preferably with, with Poland than their neighbors. And... Um, they stereotypically they wore fur hats and long sleeved caftans, baggy trousers, and sometimes polished boots, for example, and being equipped with uh, lance, saber, bow, or arquebus as well. Because the Cossacks, as you know, also are kind of more hybrid than. Um, I mean, many of these Cossacks wouldn't be properly uh, Mongol. Uh, they, they, they were actually Europeans. Like, uh, they, they had in the Ukraine kind of passed to the same Tartar lifestyle but still retaining some part of kind of low culture in and, and not this great aversion to firearms, right? So uh Cossacks had already been hired from fifteen twenty four onwards, but it was actually even here Stephen Bathory who introduced in fifteen seventy one the system of registering the Cossacks, uh, 500 uh, at the time of, of this king, uh, 
uh, for regular service that is as you know as a form of uh, enlistment and um uh, and uh and permanency in the Polish army under certain uh, circumstances and um so every all of these groups were also a couple of hundreds strong like uh, they they were hired in this numbers not very different from the rotas probably maybe a, a bit larger because they were technically lighter hence cheaper hence more numerous troops uh, at a time to be effective on the field therefore his tactical units were probably larger and they had ta uh, different tactical employment from from the others because they were mostly designed for for certain specific tasks at which they, they were the best and and as we said before there were actually tartars settled in um actually also in Poland in part but mostly in Lithuania um and they uh, you know the, this kind of light troop that eventually they would naturally intermarry with the local population so this went kind of at waves but there were also other elements coming uh, from from abroad uh, settled in uh, or hired by the king that, that would eventually remain in Poland like the Balakians for example but who were substantially armed like Cossacks and um, infantry at this point is a support arm for cavalry there is no other s s way to put it they um, very early in the 16th century that plate armor crossbows among infantry kind of vanished and the uh, the equipment would become very light i mean there was no reason to to invest too much in infantry at this point uh but infantry was also very important uh at the same time because you can't do without infantry that that is needed to hold positions to to, to seize them in the first place um and and so it's Mm, we we could expand this maybe maybe later, um, and a rot of infantry at this time was formed in ten ranks of ten. And the first being of hensios with eight foot half pikes, second and tenth armed with halberds or birdish pole axes, and the rest with arquebuses. And uh, this makes you understand it. Also, the the need of the emphasis of firepower. So on actually uh, readily and quickly deployable missile infantry uh, that that reveals also quite dynamic tactical role and therefore something that doesn't just stop to being an arquebusier like you could find in pike and shot tactics along the line kind of um, unwieldy and uh, you know uh, unmovably on Western battlefields but something different like. Uh, that they also interacted at, at close contact with cavalry. As a matter of fact, there were dragoons as well. You know, so the dismounted cavalry was also very all, uh, very common. And uh, we we discussed these things also in the video on 17th century Polish um, army organization. Um, and uh, in fact, this infantry was usually equipped also with saber and light axe, which actually denotes a quite dynamic fencing. It's quite meaningful in my opinion. By the second half of the 16th century, mail had disappeared among infantry. Um, the NCOs retained their half pikes, but the rest uh, having just arquebuses and eventually muskets. And halberds were now largely used by bodyguards now. And th there is a very slight tendency also as for the rest of... Um, European countries towards uh, uniformation uh, that at this time in early modern history is very 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 soft let's say but especially I don't know royal guards and um, this units that actually today we don't list but they were they were very composite like they, they had they were also not regular units but they were hired here but by for example by, by the single kings right that they had their own that they sometimes came from the abroad with with the with their own uh, traditional guards, right? And having, being kept in a certain way, having a sort of uniform, certain color to, to be distinguished. Um, and th there were um, 
in fact other types of infantry for example the Hungarian type which was also uh, armed uh, along the, the same lines in terms of proportion of uh, pikes and, and, and shots with the, the Polish one like 10% uh, and half pikes, 90% firearms and uh, while the German infantry usually were initially uh, armored, then eventually armor fades also among them, pikemen, right? And they um, they had shots as well, uh, armored with Morian helmets and um, fitting, let's say, more in the Western stereotypical tactics uh, as such. And uh, and actually, when we talk about, for example, German units, we have to think that, especially in the Royal Army, uh, as well as any other nationality, telling the truth, some of them were called like with that name, but without being actually from that country. Like most of them, especially towards the 17th century, were actually Polish. At one point, the Polish kings even had their own unit of Janissaries that were essentially a copy of the Ottoman Janissaries, but just you know not because they were Turkish, but they were f from a kept like that. Um, and this is this is very interesting, in my opinion, because th there was actually great dynamism and even tactical experimentation revolving around this um, these units that sometimes were, you know, th that needed to be effective, because as royal units, they, they needed to have a, an effective function Right, not just a representative one, paradoxically, because of the political problems that we talked about before. You needed these troops to be effective and loyal, and and to have an actual uh, value in the battlefield as well. Um, so mm, the as we've seen before, there was a, a difference between the Polish and L the Lithuanian military cultures in some ways. Uh, you know that Poland and Lithuania. Uh, they were ruled by a single king of the Jagiellonian dynasty, but they were not formally united between 1569. Um, and this means that up to that point, especially, the, the, ar the respective armies were quite different. Like, the Polish army was, uh, as we've seen, largely professional and based on the uh, Kopinik Lancer. Uh, more similar to, to Western fashion, and they were supported by these uh, um, uh, um, shooters, uh, at first armed with crossbows, but um, eventually with firearms. But also, telling the truth, and this is what we forgot to say, uh, after the 20s of the 16th century, um, the lighter troops in the Polish Lancs asserted using composite bows, just like the Tartars did, because they were more involved against them, as we'll see later uh, when we understand this, and this need of coping with the Tartars adopting part of their weapons as well. Um, we have observed also how we had these, um, this Polish infantry mostly initially based on, you know, uh, these armored paviziers, uh, and then uh, heavily armored half bikes, and a uh, tribal number of shooters. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding to Polish firearms, normally these were Polish made handguns, probably not some of the most updated uh, firearm typology you could find around. Um, and arquebuses, instead of being mostly imported from, from the abroad, uh, the, the Poles had this noble levy we've discussed before, the Pospolite Rugenie, um, that was still called up in time of need, but with all the problems of political negotiation that we have seen before. Uh, the noblemen were kind of argumentative. Um, there were also many, telling you the truth, uh, meaning that they, 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 represent as, uh, they represented, as we've seen, the the only actual effect, I mean, the, the um, unavoidable, um, let's say, partner you had to to contact if you wanted to have effective troops around. 
uh, Poland, and they were hard to rise. There were not many ways to impose them, right? This and and they were especially when in in service with the king, they weren't pr much of a you know very motivated, like while doing their own private business, private wars, they, they would be quite motivated. Um, this is a big problem I would like to stress. The Lithuanian army instead was something very different, as we've seen before, kind of closer to the Russian one in, in appearance. Um, Lithuania was involved in, in Russian affairs also for very long, so this explains also the, the military hybridization, of that. but also the, there was still a kind of, uh, you know, Lithuania was wilder on average. They it had, um, it, it was mm, less urbanized in Poland. It was kind of um, uh, more, uh, also tougher terrain, telling the truth. So these were similar to, 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 to the wilderness of Russia, right? And um, Lithuania had few professionals properly and the majority was provided by the boyars hmm? um, under the so-called um, uh, uh, that was this um, land service form of training and there were a few um, uh, uh, in, in Lithuania and most of them were also worse mounted than the Poles, right? And also kind of much worse equipped in comparison. Poland was wealthier, right? It was more affluent. They could afford better equipment. Lithuania quite but not. Um, for example, Lithuanian uh, knights in this wearing more often quilts than male compared to the Poles. And, and instead of skirmishing like um, their predecessors, they tended to huddle in masses. In 1538, the King Sigmund I complained that uh, the Lithuanians were incapable of defending themselves without Polish aid. This had to do also with, in fact, you know, if Poland had prob problems with magnates in a central direction, well, th this was a you know, much worse in Lithuania, even in Italy. So this was basically the reason. It's it's not a mount, much a matter, even I think of uh, lack of um, like of effective troops. It's just the the, the national cohesion was uh, inter politically and hence militarily speaking kind of loser. So um, it, it also depends uh, on which time, etc. But at this point, obviously, the Polish and Lithuanian uh, destinies were were tied for. for uh, international reasons and dynastic reasons as well, but and um, the mm, there were, as we've seen before, the Tartars settled in Lithuania, who provided excellent light cavalry for both Poland and Lithuania. And from 1569, uh, Polish practices were adopted in Lithuania and the. Um, uh, Shvushba, uh, Zemska uh, would um, disappear fundamentally, as it was absorbed into the noble levy. So this actually means that the nobility had finished to take over the, the, everything that could be <laughs> controlled, and and at that point the, uh, the general levy of Lithuanian troops passed through local aristocracy as well. And the, as we have seen before, in Polish warfare, the evolution of um, of the hussars took place like towards the, the mid 16th century, probably to also as a sort of homogenization need, uh, like it was probably spontaneous as we have observed. Uh, but it, it kind of represents a uh, s solution to, uh, mm, let's say, a military solution, a military uh, as a, a military instrument to this great territories and how you know, um, in in a much more dynamic and homogeneous military system than the, the respective lands had had henceforth, right? And uh, the first hussars being 
Serbian mercenary light horse with lance and shield and uh, the Poles soon filling the ranks and by 1527 made the, the Hussars as armored lancers and the dominant cavalry type and after 1552 the uh, um, Strelci were uh, I, I sh I'm sure it's not pronounced like this, but I'm sorry about it. Uh, I don't know how it's really like. And th they were transformed into Polish Cossacks, like those light uh, infantrymen we've seen before, um, excuse me, light uh, cavalrymen that accompanied the, the lanks, started assuming this more Cossack like fashion, with short lanks, bow and armor. Uh, uh, many of them also being unarmored, actually, and artillery, we will see it later, also was starting to be developed, mostly, maybe local manufacturers, but kind of foreign military advisors and engineers. The standard piece was a lightly crewed, long two-pounder falcon drawn by two slash four horses. And uh, this needs of centralizing had and were enhanced also by the incessant raidings that uh, the Tartars um, carried out uh, against Poland in the 16th and eventually also in the 17th century um, they weren't much of a mm, I mean that they were a serious threat in the sense that it could cause a per pretty big instability and damage to the economy not to overthrow Poland that had kind of tougher enemies er elsewhere in this sense but that's also w what triggered aside from the let's say mutuation of certain um, equipment from the Tartar uh, customs also the need of, of centralizing needing to have a, a readily deployable army for countering the Tartar rebellions and the the Tartars helped in the sense the Polish military system to, to evolve, right? Because at that point even the nobles that were not interested in giving more power to the king, however, would have their their lands ravaged by these swarms of of Tartars and needing um, a central authority bringing order back. Um, and this is the reason the Tartars were, after all, the reason uh, the main one, at least for for the existence of the Polish permanent quarter army, like the 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 one uh, the the would levy the so-called Kvarzani, um, right? The Kvarzani soldiers being this standing quarter army paid from fraction of royal revenues. That is, troops that were theoretically um, always re re deployable in some. Um, leviable, I don't know, and, and deployable in, in most circumstances. The quarter army and the royal guard, the, the royal guard of course being kind of more elitary and representing the bulk of royal forces um, around which also this quarter army gravitated. Um, and as we've seen, the magnates were somewhat more hesitant to use their armies to assist the state and they did so. Uh, they did so only when they felt their own interests were threatened. Um, and another problem is that they weren't paid. Generally, I mean, they generally were not directly paid for their service uh, unless they could obtain commissions to levy troops as part of the state army, right? And this means that these troops would remain in part still under private control. Yet uh, this would somewhat um, offered the, the noble families to kind of capitalize upon this, like exploiting. Obviously, this was a standard system in early medieval Europe. I mean, this this fact that um, commission troops were chronically like under strength and maybe not a big deal, but some some of the most entrepreneurial uh, leaders uh, would would take the opportunity of these commissions to actually enlarge their own private power 
right? Think about Wallenstein uh, in the context of the Thirty Years' War. Um, so uh, this in turn produced also good troops because if you want to ha succeed in that field, you also need kind of uh, some efficient army. So this was the best in way, and uh, and the normally the uh, the way these commissions worked weren't just about money. They, they could be uh, granted in exchange of, uh, I mean, committed in exchange of land or civil titles within the Commonwealth. Mm. And historically, only four magnatial families had to provide military contributions by law. Their properties being ordained by the same, that is Polish Parliament, to prevent the dispersion by ensuring that they were passed on to the eldest son. This is the feudalism correct in itself. I mean, uh, in Poland, I assume that it, it was like every in, in any other European country where, of course, the, 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 the land uh, the, the would be split, like the, the father's pos uh, possessions would be split at his death among his male sons. Well, here, uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth forced certain families to maintain their properties always under like uh, the the direct uh, firstborn male firstborn uh, possession so that by every generation this last these assets wouldn't get dispersed and uh, also their organization would remain essentially the same in terms of uh, capability of recruiting troops and um, you know even of certain uh, levy traditions and con continuities continuities that that existed and that facilitated the the recruitment from 1581 the Zamoyski ordination had to provide 200 men so actually they weren't so um, so great contributions, but at least they, they were something in the context, and they um, altogether they were somewhat consistent, right? Uh, the Drabants or guardsmen were the king's personal bodyguards. These were made up of gentlemen and trusted veterans. So these units were created also for the sake of social promotion. Um, the Drabans were some, something similar to the uh, English Yemen of the Guard, right? And they existed throughout the period, though uh, at various times they were called in different names, for example, as uh, Stipatores in Latin, which means halberd years, or um, uh, I knew this in, in the, the pronunciation in, in Polish, it should be something like Arsherse, something like that. They were the archers. Uh, or also more commonly bra uh, Drabant, right? And um, one of the first references of these m royal bodyguards occurs in 1565, when an Italian Ruggeri mentioned a bodyguard of 150 Drabant halberdiers receiving fox fur lined uniforms twice a year and accompanying the king on the road when they borrowed horses, boats and sports from the royal staples. This is very important because it tells you how uniformation worked still at this fairly early age. Like, these guys were given the... Um, I think the, the not even properly... The, the, the uniforms already made because sometimes the state provided you just with the textile, with the clothes, then you, you had some to find someone to, to make the, the dress for you. The important being just being of the, made of the same material. I'm not sure in this case. But here you see that they, they were also in part f for the sake of representation, but they borrowed horses, boots and sports from royal stables. So they drew their equipment from a from a permanent uh, source that belonged to the state and it's definitely very important and by the 80s of the 16th century men from these so-called trusted um, uh, would 
be frequently appointed as rotomasters for the Vebranievska infantry, which means that this unit wasn't just like a tactical unit itself, it was also, as we've seen before, a mean of social promotion that in a sort of school for officers, right? There were gentlemen, hence noblemen, uh, trusted veterans, uh, so we can't imagine the youth of the nobles' families, etc., that would become, the were kind of, uh, you know, protected by the king that eventually would, uh, in exchange for loyalty, would entrust them with prestigious um, military appointments, right, as rotomasters. Uh, of infantry as well, Th this is particularly interesting because it tells you that infantry in part, even in this royal uh, army, w was kind of important, it was not uh, secondary and so um, consider, yeah okay well uh, for example, um, we know, we have even certain pictures for, of these troops from the, the Drabant bodyguard of Sigismund II, for example, that um, was present at a meeting of the same, right? And this guardsmen for the corps of royal guard during the 16th century were armed with halberds, usually w wearing Western clothes, like, um, uh, for example, German, baggy German Pluderhosen trousers and felt hats. Right. Um, and speaking of German customs as well, um, there would be, as we've seen, lots of German mercenaries, not just among infantry, but also among cavalry, like being the the German cuirassier being kind of the most common heavy cavalry type among the, the Polish mercenaries in uh, from from the I mean from from the abroad and there were Landsknechten um, participating to the, the Polish army as mercenaries they fought in different contexts uh, like pro and against the Poles and eventually also in King Battery's campaigns against the in Moscow, Muscovy, 1579, for example, and they were kind of flamboyantly and col colorly clothed, as in the typical Western fashion, and they had been there for since ever. Like Poland had always made use of German mercenaries since we we can remember, and um, uh, during the 16th century, some of them were were heavily armored as well, so they weren't just the typical kind of medium infantry, you just pike, I mean, th these were kind of picked troops in, in many ways, and they also had n a number of arquebusiers and musketeers in, in support. The Italian Guanini mentions that in 1574 the newly elected King Henry uh, of Valois of France arrived in Poland with a personal bodyguard of 40 Walloon musketeers and, Sw uh, and 60 Swiss halberdiers. Dressed also, in this case, it would baggy pluderhosen and paneled in yellow and green silks, right? So now that the, the French also made considerable use of Swiss mercenaries, so um, there were also continued contacts between Poland and France historically in the modern age. During the modern age, that included, uh, aside from strictly, you know. Ha being there for strictly dynastic reasons, but you know, have revolving around also this military advising, and uh, that these troops actually uh, vehiculated because these troops weren't just normal mercenaries; they were, you know, chosen troops, chosen veterans, officers, and other that would mm, follow the king as kind of picked troops and having a special training and certain. Um, uh, you know, status, etc., to have context to to spread broadly. Also, what their military background was, and and helping to organize also the the local military, kind of more more Western models. Um, 
interestingly enough, there were properly German communities in Poland. Like Poland, not the, at the time being like today, it is essentially a mononational country. Um, after the 20th century, um, was plenty of Germans, especially in the area uh, formerly dominated by the Teutonic Order, and uh, an enormously important community was the one of Danzig on the Baltic, that was a large German community, um, kind of uh, completely westernized in military culture. They didn't have an army in the sense of uh, professional... Uh, they, they weren't really uh, they were a city state in some ways but they had fundamentally militia right and they were able at times even to stop the entire Swedish army from um, uh, from invading Poland they they had an importance it was not uh, irrelevant in this context and the wealthier citizens were initially organized into separate patrician companies um, they were equipped in kind of German fashion, for example, with the Knecht Arnisch uh, armor and a long ornate wheel lock muskets with um, musketeers, powder flask and lock spanners. Um, they, mm, there were, there is a, enough evidence of, of these uh, Danzig, Danzig militia because the city was well connected with the West there are there were archives from from that time fortunately uh still surviving and um it was a city that was in contact with some of the most advanced uh military cultures of the west like one of the netherlands and flanders and so, so we we know fa fairly a lot about it and the the and it's interesting that uh, an author like Morrison thought at the time that the citizens of Danzig were more rich upper hill than any other Germans. Right. So this tells you also about the wealth of this city state. It was very important in fact as in the Polish crown asset. Speaking of artillery that we hinted at before just in the, in this early times, um well it was largely staffed by foreigners, particularly Italians. And um, many of the guns were produced in Poland, though, and uh, there was some uh, improvement. The St. Paul's uh, did, especially at this time. There would be a major reform in the 17th, but already under King of uh, the 17th century, but King Bathory uh, was credited by in contemporary literature, list, uh, literature at least, with the invention of the so-called fiery bullets. There was a type of incendiary ammunition that was used with great effect in the 50, 79 to 82 Muscovite campaigns. And this worked w by um, laying in a wadding of sand or ashes, uh, followed by moist greenery to prevent a preheated ball from igniting the powder charge. And the Muscovites managed to counter this at one point just by constructing their fortresses, um, fortress walls with from thin layers of wood backed by hearth which smothered the, the hot ball quickly right? and you can imagine what like Muscovy could be like in the 16th century like all in wood like th that this incendiary stuff was very effective um, and what is interesting is that as early as the 16th century the artillerymen in Poland were generally issued with cloth for uniforms right uh, they, um, you know, albeit it varied in character, but it, it's still meaningful, and it, it tells, in my opinion, the fact that that especially the crown was investing in it. Like, you know, artillery was a great, um, you know, it kind of catalyzed the centralization of the state during the modern age because it was so expensive that you needed just a larger organization to to provide large and increasingly more standardized uh, types uh, of guns, uh, standardized guns and barrels in general, and, and, and having the logistics and the supply system to move it, right? So the fact that it was uniform, it speaks for the fact that, of course, even if there was plenty of kind of um, old 
kind of outdated artillery all, all around in Poland, even magnates had bishops, had their own artillery, stuff like that, but the, the, the crown was leading, was the the improve the technological improvement and the, the production of artillery and, and its banning in, in the royal like in the state of army um, the, there was other um, there were other types of units that now would be interesting to, to talk about for example but we don't have much time um, the Iduks there were, these were Hungarian um, uh, or uh, infantrymen or Polish infantry in Hungarian style uniform as we've seen before the Magyarka caps for example were kind of tip Magyarka actually caps were kind of famous and useful uh, u uh, usual at the time um, so we could go on um, but I would mostly concentrate instead on the Tartars that I find very very fascinating because, as we've seen before, they largely contributed sometimes to, to the Polish army itself. And the most powerful group of Tartars around, as you know, was the Great Horde uh, that the, um, that still was a state like in, in the East. Uh, and in 1502-03 uh, a number of Tartars had migrated to the Crimean Peninsula, right? In the, the the relative security that this land offered made the Tartars uh, adopting a semi-settled way of life. So hence we know the the Crimean Tartars that were wiped out by Stalinist deportations during the 1930s. But uh, Crimea was essentially that thing, and um, they still um, retained, as a name, the, the, their can, the, the one of the can of the Great Horde. Right? Um, the old lands of the Great Horde in the north and the east of Crimea were filled with this no, so-called Nogai Tartars, especially. And the sources say that there were lots of them, like a normal Tartar army could count theoretically hundreds of thousands of horses which um, it, it's maybe an exaggeration but it, it's not excessively far from the truth I mean especially in terms of horses proper like um, Mongol armies usually had a lot of spare horses so uh, naturally any fighting force at this time think, didn't think it could surpass 50,000 right but um, it, you know, it gives you an idea of the masses of of these peoples, and the number was their deal because individually they, you know, that they weren't much of a of a threat. They 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 worked tactically en masse, etc. Their society was basically not stratified particularly. There were lots, lots, lots of freemen and uh, just a tiny elite. And um, in fifteen ninety four, an imperial agent, La Sota, learned from a Tatar prisoner called Belek that one of the Crimean Khan's army of eighty thousand men moving on Poland, only about twenty thousand were fi uh, were fit for battle, right? Um. And aside from this enmity with the Commonwealth, many Tartars served in the Polish army. Uh, this was true especially in Lithuania, where the Grand Duke Witold had settled a large number of Tartars at the end of the 14th century, especially around Vilno, and also had allowed to intermarry with the local population. And it's estimated then in the 16th century there were about 200,000 Tartars in Lithuania and albeit they were Muslim they spoke either Belarusian or Polish and there were many tribes among these groups um, for example the Uishun, the Naiman, Yalair, the Congret and the Barin 
right? And and especially also their tribal aristocracy, the Olands, that would become, as you know, later on, kind of a even a typology of of unit in Western warfare because of this in fact original tactical tradition of the people. And each tribe owed military service for their land, right? So they were settled uh, in exchange for uh, for military service, and they usually relied, however, like they responded to the nobility, that in turn responded to the king of of Poland. Um, but the, the, theoretically, the Polish king could ask, like, for all the Tartars, these individual tribes, to, to to uh, and freemen to to serve as well uh, this was also a matter of political negotiation and interestingly enough many tartars were actually also hired directly for the polish and lithuanian state armies right so they fitted not just in the local tribal levy but at one point with a senatorization as you can imagine also to the properly polish lithuanian army and um, it, the usually the, the Tartar organization, as you know, was decimal. Um, while in the Polish service, the Tartars would be framed in two units of uh, other uh, of comrade system in two banners between six and two hundred men. Um, the name for defining the uh, Lithuanian Tartar soldiers was Lipta. Right from the name of Lithuania itself, so it was kind of uh, that's how stereotypical it had become. Um, but there were also other steppe peoples fighting. Um, you know, I mean, that were considered Tartars by the Poles, and that also fought against and for uh, the Commonwealth. For example, the uh, Chermis um, that raised uh, a small number of units of mounted uh, arquebusiers from 1574 um, and also the most the more important Circassian Piotrzy tribe that later became uh, the, stand the standard medium cavalry of Lithuania so for seeing how important these um, elements were locally even in society and the Piotrians were also tributaries to the Tatar Khan which is very interesting because it tells you how decentralized this, this these communities were technically for both of the, of these uh, states fundamentally, and they they were extremely useful in this sense because they they were kind of a political thermometer for the both of them realizing what the intention of one of the other state were. Um, the Tartars functioned very well as scouts and guides. And they were the most important element of the raiding parties of an army. And uh, especially from the 70s uh, of the 16th century, the Tartars begin to appear regularly in the Polish-Lithuanian army with continuity. And um, th there were many, like for example, there was one famous rota under the Polonized Tartar Termok that had illustrious history lasting over 30 years. Um, it contained Petorians as well as Circassians, Cossacks and Tartars so these units had bypassed fundamentally uh, the the tribal context of origin in terms of military organization and they were regular soldiery uh, or mercenaries if you prefer and, um, and sometimes uh, all these names identified the same type of cavalry itself and the and there is a kind of s segmentation in these units as well for example the uh, Tatar Petorians and Chermis were armed in Cossack style male shirts um, which means that they were wealthy and affluent so we, we don't know whether it's because either it was the they were kind of uh, elite in their context of origin or because they became rich through service or whatever but this shows that they were uh, further integrated not just as, as the stereotypical light 
cavalry, but as something more that entails probably kind of sanitarization uh, in part. Um, they, you know, the, the Cossacks originally were part, they, they were Tartars as well, but um, the, let's say, the, by settling down in the Ukraine, etc., the, the, it's, it's the same U local Slavs that became to be part of the Cossacks. So the Cossacks were, you know, why, of course, mixed with kind of steps peoples, but being essentially white people, if you look at that. Um, and uh, th this is important because you realize that they, it's like the, the local Slavs who started leaving kind of in the Tartar fashion and not the other way around and retaining their own, the, 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 the steps military culture and some additional uh, military, you know, character coming from the more Western uh, background. Um, and... Uh, you know, there were many, there is an enormous literature about the Cossacks. Um, they were peoples that, as we have seen here, were kind of scattered in between of several powers, like between the, the Russians, the, the Poles, the, the, the Golden Horde, the, the, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Turks, for example, um, <coughs> saw the Cossacks essentially as freebooters, not much of, a, of an ethnic element, but as kind of a bunch of more of the years essentially and the, the, Gon the Don Cossacks are perhaps the, the most uh, famous um, and um, albeit they didn't have much of a contact with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in this specific period and, um, and kind of more active and more interesting are the Cossacks based in the Polish-Ukraine actually, the Zaporozins, right? Um, Zaporoi meaning literally be, uh, beyond the cataracts and th this community lived on the islands of the, the Dnieper River and as a consequence they were vo virtually invulnerable, invulnerable to attack from other Tartars and this Zaporozian community was established in the 16th century in the Dnieper island of Kortizia and this became known as the Sek and they, their deal was kind of, um, they, they were essentially adventurers, like uh, pirates, raiders, etc., along the, the Dnieper River and the Black Sea, uh, on the, uh, in the steppe, right, and returning uh, in, uh, to the sack in, in winter. And they, they were kind of um, an anarchic democracy, being kind of a bunch of Pirates essentially just living there without much of a further organization, but uh, and they 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 had naturally they were pretty unruly as you as you understand they they, they stressed this egalitarian character against the, the surrounding more more stratified political systems like they they lived as a you know at the outskirts of these powers and exploiting their, their weaknesses, right? Um, and they were famous for their martial abilities, of course, their bizarre hairstyles, uh, drinking, singing, right? right. Um, and albeit kind of, uh, you know, disorganized, they, they actually had a firm discipline, like, because they, they had developed this function is, in as much as it allowed them to to be effective in their raids, etc., and uh, the, the were, mm, for example, they banned alcohol in during military expeditions, which is kind of very interesting because objectively, it's something you find also in other military contexts. Like think about the Vietnam War, and we think about everybody was dragged, uh, but this mostly happened in the uh, in the back front, like not on the field. On the field you were forbidden to use drugs because contrarily to what is commonly believed that it's pretty damn risky for yourself and for other people so it doesn't help you at all to to deal with with threat as it, it's often so we should talk about the use of drugs on, in warfare at one point because it's it's actually very interesting um, and um, 
there were the um, there was an an attraction like this sub Pavarotian element because they were mm, like th they were a free port like they had a, they they made slave slave trade for example and they were quite useful uh, like many slaves that were used by the Polish or Lithuanian magnates, for example, came from the Zaporozhian uh, trade. Um, and uh, and at, at one point, however, they started becoming more rebellious towards the north and uh, creating, um, creating problems, um, especially in the Ukraine. Um, and, and also expanding, in fact, Tartar military culture beyond in this area. And, and and causing, in fact, m mass f flees to to Poland, Lithuania, and Muscovy because you know living in the Ukraine had become kind of difficult because of these continuous raids. And Gamberini noted in 1586 that quote, desperate men who, having committed various excesses, could not live securely everywhere, came from as far as Germany, France, Italy, and Spain. So you understand what what the deal was. It was the an, a no man's land in some ways, but just of these people. And uh, yet, the the lands of the Zaporozhians, as we have seen, were at least technically part of the Polish Commonwealth. And um, it, it it may seem amazing that this anarchic society survived, uh, all with the constant threat of the intervention from Poland. And the reason it survived is that it actually provided as an effective early warning system against Tartar raiding, right, by keeping an eye on the main crossing points of the Dnieper River. And uh, the Poles initially at least thought the Tartars uh, the more dangerous, right. So the Cossacks um, um uh, however, exaggerated at one point uh, that their disruptive attitude in the Ukraine got worse, and that's where the Polish established a central register to limit the number of men allowed to pursue the Cossack li lifestyle. Um, that also came from from Poland to 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 live like that. And um, at one point, we know that uh, a unit of 300 Lowland Cossacks had served in Polish army in 1569. Um, although th this first register of Cossacks was set up by King Bathory in 1578, and it actually contains the names of 500 Lowland and Saporozhian Cossacks that were um, organized into a military unit commanded actually by a Ukrainian magnate, which, which is pretty interesting, uh, which whose name I will not pronounce because it sounds kind of complicated, like Michal Wisniewicki, something like that. Um, there was Starosta of um, Cherkasy and Kanev. And these Cossacks, the registered by um, the, the Polish crown, uh, were paid a small salary that uh, meant uh, essentially cloth uniform that was distributed annually Right, in return for a promise of a more responsible behavior, <laughs> you know, and as you can imagine, this was pretty loose. Um, and but it's interesting that there was some, um, you know, uni su system supply of this of, of uniforms for these troops. Um, and the idea is that uniforms, of course, last for a few times. So, I mean, after two months of campaign, you you don't physically have a uniform anymore. Um, with it, the clothes of the times, etc. So, but this was still a way of being dependent on the crown. Could kind of at least divert the, this people's action towards kind of more um, useful uh, directions for the crown. Um, and uh, the poles in in this r registers identified all Cossacks on the register as Zaporozhians. While many of them were also raised in northern Ukraine, um, and in fact the commander himself uh, became known as the Hetman of the Zaporozhians.
right? And um, and and this system of registering didn't have, as you can imagine, much of a effect to hold the the Cossacks. Um, yet uh, it was increased over time. In 1583, the registered Cossacks rose to 600. Um, yeah. Another interesting element of Polish warfare is kind of undervalued and that we will have to talk about because I think it's very interesting and it has many connections with others is is the wagon train, the wagon fort, right? Uh, normally we attribute this to the most famous um, bohemian wagon fort during the Hussite Wars and, and partly also to the Hungarians in their uh, clash against the Ottomans in the late uh, 15th and early 16th century. And as far as I know, there is a lot of research to be made still on those specific contexts. But also the Poles used it. You know that, you know, wagon f trains slash forts are actually something that has always been used historically, especially in great in wide areas, right, where you don't have much of a natural defense, like in the steppes. But as I know, even, I don't know, in the last years, the, the, the French military uh, in the Sahara uh, Desert uh, used this, like, with pickups and trucks, you know, they formed wagon f force, for, for, you know, just for, I even in camping, right. Um, so this is actually pretty... It's more famous usually among the steppes peoples, but you can find it here in Poland as well. In this vast flatlands of the east, um, of the Ukraine especially. Um, and the there was a kind of uh, way of central, like, uh, in terms of supply lines, right? You know, th this was a problem for the Poles, because as we've seen, spaces were very long. So and the central organization was relatively low and there was a little in the way of a centralized distribution system uh, but there was some kind of administration in the Polish military regarding to these matters there was at least one organized section of the army um, in which everyone had kind of a was responsible for all either the, the equipment, the ammunition, the food um and the the supplies were carried uh in, in various wagons as you can imagine and the result is also that polish armies were of course more efficient but also had needed to to have larger baggage trains than than the usual uh given especially their cavalry Require you know the cavalry requires an enormous logistical effort, um, and most and Polish armies were mostly mounted at this point. So th this element was particularly um, uh, important. There were certain units that were detached, especially the, the dragoons, uh, to um, to defend trains, uh, baggage trains and artillery, uh, especially. And the, um, the sometimes they, they they were literally an escort to the wagons during the, the wagons o over the march, which is nothing strange in military history. But you can find it um, in the wars against the Tartars and to extend even to the Vienna campaign later in the 17th century. Um, and the important part of the story is that, however. Um, the Polish used this wagon trains kind of more extensively than other peoples. Um, some say that this derives from the Tabor um, of Bohemia by Jan Siska that um, had served as a mercenary in Poland at the beginning of the 15th century. But we can't say that it was probably a, a more widespread use because of the you know, logistical needs we, we have just explained. Um, and, 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 and in fact, the Poles, the Zaporozhian Cossacks in particular, were certainly as talented in using the Tabor as were the Hussites, right? 
Um, there is a special mention we can make for British mercenaries um, raised in service in Poland. Uh, Scots, English and Irish men um, joined uh, the Polish army, uh, especially from the Celtic fringe where a lot of people who needed employment in the rest of Europe and Poland made for it. Um, and the Scots were valued especially for their skill in musketry and as King Bathory's secretary Piotrowski noted uh, because they had something more uh, kind of above the Germans in willingness to light and in bravery and uh, the we know that there were also many Scots um, especially in later times, there were a component of Polish, uh, you know, uh, we were a community that had an importance to counterbalance the others in the Polish politics as well, locally. And this was the deal of kings, like to put as many different communities in, in the kingdom so that they would kind of all counterbalance the other and would start depending more on the crown. Um, we know that at this time in the 16th century at least many Scottish officers wore heavy armor in battle there is a German chronicler that is born back uh, which says that the Scottish captain Gurley fell into a river near Danzig when wounded and uh, was drowned by the weight of his armor and the, the there is kind of iconographical evidence, etc. There are very important troops we didn't discuss very much were the Valachian cavalrymen, right? Um, there were many Romanians, Valachians, Transylvanians, and Moldovans, um, and other peoples from further into the Balkans, and even from Albania, telling the truth, that served in uh, Polish pay. Um, but they became more popular, like, more in, um, especially the Valachians in later times in the 17th century, right? Um, yet, they, they were present since the beginning, and this influenced also local Polish um, fashion, for example. The Hungarians and the Valachians were actually quite similar, but seemingly the, the second preferred large fur hats and long rounded beards as well. Um, there were certain sp specific and famous breeders of fine ambling horses, like the, um, the known as the Yetno Cho Dniki or something like that. I can't pronounce it. Um, that um, th that had a trained horses in this not just in walk, trot and gallop but also in this known as amble pace in which both legs of, on one side of the body went forward at the same time right? and Valachians especially fought as light cavalry and um, they and, and had in common to the Tartars a little bit the fact that they spurned firearms they considered them humane and preferred bow and spear right and uh, this was very fascinating in my opinion. Um, there could be I don't know what else we can uh, we can say um, about uh, you know the various influence of the Tartars in uh, in, in certain camp equipment. But you know I think you got the idea of what this thing was. Uh, I think I'm more satisfied about the, the other video I made about 17th century Polish organization and these are actually just very general videos that I make for spreading awareness on the existence of these military systems and kind of framing them um, better. Like I think everybody knows about Polish hussars like but it can't you have to understand the, the whole military system in order to understand why there were even Polish Usars, and you can't think of Polish Usars if you don't consider this whole elements of the, the rest of the Polish army because it doesn't make any freaking sense. Like just thinking only about military aspects and knowing not knowing what Poland was from a political and social point of view. Um, so I, the more we talk about Polish warfare, the more we realize how varied, how dynamic, how um, original it was um, 
and, and for its possibilities, like it, it, it was pretty amazing if you think about it. Like a, a state with such a low degree of centralization. Okay, at the time it wasn't so. Um, like we're still in the early modern period. Like not even the Western markets are this enormous uh, amount of centralization yet. But still, in comparison to to Poland, Lithuania, they were kind of advanced. The system went on also because it was in fact threatened by several enemies. And uh, th throughout these two centuries, uh, Polish-Lithuanian warfare gave its best. Right, and uh, this this is especially the second half of the 16th century. It's a bit of the acme of, uh, of power, of prestige in Europe, etc. And it's also an enormous land. We think especially about this now. Today we didn't have time to to get into details specifically of every context. May maybe one day we will do it. Like there is no limit aside my, you know, my existence. <laughs> let's say um, by uh, the 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 and. You know, but just for today, I think I wanted to give this mm, overlook, like uh, on on the on the specific c military culture, and to reflect it further and confront it also with the one I've made about the, the 17th century, right? And realizing the world. The whole, the complexity of this system. Maybe I don't know whether this video was effective or not, <laughs> because um, it, it's actually an enormous topic, uh, as you understand. This, this is a brutal synthesis. It's incomplete. Today we didn't talk much of a. Uh, okay, the 17th century m Polish military organization is kind of more complex. Like it has more to say, especially also in the creation of um, uh, stronger army and uh, central uh, more strongly centralized army and also developments in artillery and farms and etc but th this 16th century is also mer very very meaningful in my opinion because it shows um, and I myself understood it just only properly now how effectively there was a switch from kind of a more western context into a more eastern one it, this is this is kind of unique in I can't think maybe of I don't know, of Serb, probably in Hungary it was it was somewhat similar. You know that Hungary is basically wiped out at this point. Um, two thirds go to the Ottomans, one third to the Austrians, and and re overall it becomes a kind of a frontier, and it kind of loses its you know kind of more Western kind of monarchic character, etc. But uh, w with Poland, you find a functional, uh, largely functional system that is actively transitioning from a kind of more strictly western I don't know how do you, you want to defi define it kind of Frankish feudal whatever car military organization and, and unit types and um, into something that uh, pertains more to, to another area another military culture and, and this is done willingly like, because it was imposed by someone and because the state was conquered by anyone on the contrary this time it was a solid power that was making its active choices um, and th this is what makes it even more interesting and th that's why this the Polish armies actually at the time were pretty outstanding in their own regard and they they deserve a lot more of attention aside from the stereotypical thing of they okay everybody loves uh, Polish hussars, they're fantastic objectively, I love them. Um, uh, they, they, I went to Poland last year, it was it was amazing to visit um, museums, etc., armor and equipment, etc. So, but um, I made a video with all the photos about that, the military memorabilia from Warsaw, if you're interested. And but, but it's not just that, like you have to understand really deeply the history of this country and, 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 and why it produced what it produced and why it was so effective. So this, in my opinion, is actually very, very, very important. Okay, so for now, uh, I don't know, because I think I exhausted, you know, that I picked my topics randomly. I think I exhausted part, at least, of Polish. Maybe uh, um, um, I would like to concentrate more on Polish wagons that today we, we talked about a bit superficially. And that I sus suspect actually are very are a very fascinating topic.
um, and therefore we will make a video about them uh, at one point specifically I think it's interesting uh, but for now I mean we covered at least um, these two parts the 16th and the 17th century respectively will pass to other to other peoples as well um, but I ex you know at one point um, I plan to expand into uh, like into early medieval uh, excuse me early modern warfare more more intensely than, than what I've done and uh, I don't know we'll make other surely other videos about Polish Lithuanian warfare as well all right um, for now uh, I think it's all I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time. See you next time. Bye.